wait for the yeah i gonna hit got it all right so thank you uh thank you all for uh, uh having me here it's already been a very uh interesting morning uh i yeah i have to say you know my my work has been shaped uh, a lot uh, by uh, stuff that's been done here at penn uh, for you know quite a while uh, and so it's uh, really great uh, to be here finally in person. Uh, I, you know, like it took a while to make that happen, but now it did. Uh, uh, and I'm very much looking forward also uh, to the rest of the day. So um, uh, my lab studies um, the mechanisms of adaptive cognitive behavior, primarily uh, in the human brain. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about here, the human brain uh, today. Um, so um, no, I didn't have, so so um, our decisions uh, differ primarily um, and fundamentally from from uh, reflex behaviors uh, in terms of uh, their you know flexibility. So continuously adjusting to uh, changing context in which uh, all behavior unfolds, and that what really sets them apart from these much more. Uh, stereotypical forms of um, uh, behaviors here. And so I think that this uh, flexibility at the level of behavior um, uh, emerges from uh, basically like a continuous reconfiguration of highly task specific pathways um, uh, in higher parts of the brain, in particular uh, the cerebral cortex. Uh, so let's take a, a concrete and relatively simple example. And now, if you're asked to do such an orientation discrimination task where you know you judge uh, the orientation of these grating stimuli in the laboratory, you can easily report the vertical orientation of this grating here by pushing a button uh, with your left hand, uh, horizontal orientation by pushing a button with your right hand. Or you could use the exact opposite uh, mapping rule. Um, and uh, well, these these rules are completely arbitrary. There's no sort of predominant uh, you know sensory motor association of either of these two forms here. It's entirely set by the task. And what's more, you can switch between these two types of rules uh, in a very, very rapid fashion. Uh, so here's the behavior of a bunch of participants doing this task uh, in our lab. Uh, that's a study that was done by Kino Hagener doing his medical doctoral studies and also this postdoc in the lab, Rudy van der Brink. We're showing here is the fraction of uh, choices that are consistent uh, with the first of those rules here in orange. And we're plotting that time lock to the moment where in between two trials of this main task, uh, we're instructing a, a switch in the rule by virtue of this uh, very explicit and you know, unambiguous cue. Uh, and then this new rule will uh, stay in effect for the next pair of trials. And then there's again another switch. Um, and so, so what you see here basically is that uh, the uh, behavior of the participants and really almost all of them becomes you know, almost perfectly consistent with the newly instructed rule already the very first trial uh, after uh, the switch here, right? And that's just a couple of seconds later. So, so while subjects produce this, uh, you know, uh, very flexible root switching behavior, um, we think what is happening is uh, that there's a continuous, uh, basically switching between two, you know, task specific pathways connecting, um, uh, well, you know, orientation selective neurons in the visual cortex, uh, you know, selective for either vertical or horizontal, shown here, you know, in these stripes, uh, and action selective neurons coding one of those two effector movements here uh, in the premotor cortex. Uh, and, uh, well, which of these populations here for, you know, uh, sort of selective for one of the sensory features communicates with, uh, you know, an action selective population here? that really depends entirely on uh, the rule. Um, and I don't think the colors are all that clear, but the, I hope the idea is clear. So this is um, the, the, the idea that we wanted to test. And that's of course just you know, a cartoon. Uh, what I'm going to show now is some uh, fMRI data from one single example you know, subject uh, doing this task in the scanner. And uh, what we're looking at here is the correlation of uh, spontaneous uh, fluctuations in the fMRI signal during the intertrial intervals between this, you know, actual task here that they're doing in the scanner, um, uh, and correlations between the visual cortex and the premotor cortex. And critically, uh, we're not correlating, uh, as is, you know, commonly done in, you know, fMRI functional connectivity analysis, the overall sort of growth signal, uh, you know, in visual cortex and premotor cortex, but rather what we're correlating is highly feature-specific signals. Uh, so, so we're taking 
uh, in visual cortex selecting here in this case for this example more or less by hand you know voxels that uh, preferentially respond to uh, you know horizontal gradings or vertical gradings and likewise premotor voxels uh, that encode one or the other effective and so <clears throat> the idea behind this analysis really comes uh, from essentially uh, noise cor correlation analysis or feature specific noise correlation analysis as they're often being done in animal physiology, you know, monkeys uh, uh, and, and uh, now more and more also in rodents where you have parallel recordings of many different neurons at the same time and can kind of select basically, you know, like feature selective neurons at the sensory stage, say, or in this case, also at the uh, uh, motor stage in this kind of fashion. And what, what uh, I think you can see here at a glance without going through all the different pairs is that the feature selectivity really matters. So, so there's clear uh, structure here uh, that, you know, I should say the thin lines are, are um, uh, examples. These, these are runs, like, you know, uh, some, uh, separate scans of the same subject. And the, um, uh, the thick line is uh, the average for that particular subject. And I hope you can see just, you know, by eye that there is, uh, it really matters which, you know, pairs of uh, voxels you're correlating. There's a clear pattern with this crossover here. And most critically, uh, this uh, uh, feature specific structure here, it, it flips depending on which rule is currently active, yeah, uh, from here to here. And that's, without going through all these, you know, pairs here, that's exactly in line with basically this, uh, uh, you know, um, sort of dynamic sort of circuit reconfiguration scheme that we have in mind here. Right, so that's just one example out of many uh, that we've got over the uh, last uh, few years in my lab, uh, supporting this idea that this kind of adaptive behavior, essentially all adaptive behaviors really emerge from highly flexible network dynamics and, you know, what seems like extremely plastic cortical pathways. And um, we think that... Uh, this um, rapid form of plasticity that's, you know, to a large extent sort of conferred by inputs uh, from modulatory systems of the brainstem, such as uh, the uh, locus rullius uh, Nordrelin system, which, you know, uh, many people here at Josh Lab, for instance, are studying this as well has, you know, massive diffuse projections to cortex. Um, mm -hmm. And it also happens, the locus rullius happens to be correlated in its activity with the diameter of the pupil, which is something that we can exploit in our research. And the last point here is uh, that's more speculation at the moment, even though we have some first data that, that uh, are in line with this idea. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a medical doctor also originally, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty much convinced that it's precisely this interplay between neuromodulatory you know, uh, uh, systems deep down in the brainstem and uh, these highly you know, specific uh, cortical pathways doing cognitive computations that fundamentally goes awry in many uh, important mental uh, disorders. Right, so in my lab, we uh, test uh, these ideas uh, through, um, you know, what I like to think of as a very integrative approach. Uh, so, so we do systematic manipulations uh, of uh, the environmental context. Uh, for instance, you know, task rules like we've seen before, or the volatility of the environment. I'm going to show an example of this also later in the talk. Um, uh, in many experiments, we also systematically manipulate sort of the internal neuromodulatory state uh, through uh, systemic pharmacological interventions. That's all we can do in humans at the moment still, you know, but it is, it turns out to be quite informative. So there we give, you know, selective drugs uh, that target one or the other uh, neuromodulatory system. Um, and uh, we do recordings, uh, uh, in this case, using high resolution brainstem, fMRI, uh, of, um, well, the whole brain, but with a particular focus also on these small brainstem structures here as people are performing the task and definitely throughout, you know, uh, using uh, the pupil as an index uh, of uh, this, this sort of central arousal state. And we then um, uh, sort of um, read out the impact of changes in context and internal state on cognitive uh, computations, basically. And to this end, uh, we make use of what I call here, you know, uh, tracking of cortical representations of cognitive variables using fMRI or MEG recordings. I'm, you know, not going to talk about this much. You'll see concrete examples later. We do detailed uh, quantitative analysis of behavior with the idea that we want to sort of infer the underlying, you know, uh, latent sort of process of computations uh, that um, uh, give rise to the behavior and uh, that also gives rise to latent variables that we think are encoded in uh, patterns of uh, cortical population activity. 
And for this, uh, like computational modeling plays a really important role uh, here um, throughout. Uh, so this is a little bit hidden here, but um, what we're using throughout is like these more abstract kind of algorithmic models of uh, cognitive computations uh, um, that uh, we can you know, directly fit to behavior. Many of these models that we're using, they're, they're actually developed here uh, at Penn, like, you know, in uh, JAR's lab or Allen's lab. Uh, so, we, you know, we, we're basically just consumers, so they always do great stuff here, and we can just take it and <laughs> use it readily to whatever we have. Uh, we also um, uh, often take uh, or simulate um, more detailed uh, sort of, you know, uh, models of cortical circuits um, uh, in the task uh, that our participants are doing, solving, you know, these, these kinds of problems. Uh, the idea here is uh, that they can inform somehow also about the underlying sort of neurotransmitters uh, and, you know, receptors and so on. That's particularly important for the translational stuff that we're doing to, to really connect this to a lot of work that's out there on a sort of a molecular basis of psychiatric disorders. I'm not going to talk about this much uh, here today. Now, I'm going to skip this. Um, let's just look at this um, uh, and, you know, like this, this approach somehow at work, uh, going back to this example I had in the introduction here. Um, so, so the first thing that we do is uh, that we use what I call, you know, re representational tracking uh, sort of with the fMRI signal uh, to basically, uh, you know, quantify or um, capture this feature-specific noise uh, correlation pattern in a somewhat more compact format so that we don't always have to select individual voxels and always, you know, like uh, scrutinize or look at these different pairs of correlations. So, so uh, what, what we do is uh, we first train uh, pattern classifiers um, to decode um, either the stimulus orientation or uh, the action chosen by the subject from uh, the multi-voxel patterns uh, that you can see here sort of uh, you know, written as a, just you know, uh, this, this uh, uh, vector here, uh, multi-voxel patterns of the evoked fMRI responses that we measure during the trials of the actual task, okay? And I mean, this is a super trivial thing that's been done like you know a gazillion times now in fMRI and gives the you know exactly expected results. So we can decode the stimulus orientation uh, from um, the the response patterns in early visual cortex, uh, the action from uh, you know action selective regions in the cortical motor system here, parietal cortex, premotor, motor cortex, and some subcortical structures. Now, no surprise here. So, so the thing that we do then is that we take these classifiers that we trained on the evoked activity and apply them to the spontaneous activity fluctuation uh, that we measure or the multi-voxel patterns of the spontaneous activity fluctuations that we measure during the very long inter-trial intervals uh, of uh, this, this task. Uh, and we also you know, can, can apply them also to the um, the, the trial, the activity during the trial epochs after having regressed out for every single voxel, the evoke response, but that's more technicality. Um, so what this gives us then, when we just simply project the, you know, uh, the, 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 the classifier weight vector on, on this uh, activity pattern, we get a scalar time series here uh, that describes uh, basically how the, for, you know, visual cortex say and the orientation classifier, how the population code for orientation in visual cortex uh, you know, fluctuates between, you know, more tending towards the, the vertical orientation or the horizontal orientation. And uh, we take these uh, continuous classifier outputs during the, you know, blank period. We take them seriously because of um, a lot of beautiful optical imaging work that's been done in monkeys in the early 2000s that shows really that, you know, in the, the, the population code for orientation in, in V1 is not, you know, the spontaneous activity is not sort of non-specific, but it seems to visit distinct orientation specific states uh, uh, sequentially over time. And we think that's what our classifier here is tapping into. And likewise, uh, for you know, uh, the action classifiers and premotor cortex, we get then a time series that you know, tells us whether the code tends more towards uh, left hand or right hand button press. And then all we do is that we correlate these continuous classifier outputs um, uh, separately for segments of time when one or the other rule uh, was active, right? And the idea here is that if uh, what I've shown before for this example subject, you know, holds up, what we should see is that there's basically um, a correlation here and here in both of these cases, but with an opposite sign. So we should look for the sign flip, and that's our sort of proxy of this, this you know, switch uh, in the, it's, you know, feature-specific noise correlation structure. Right, so... Um, 
let's hold that thought. We do another thing to make this a little bit more informative also about cognitive computation, which is that we um, uh, basically replace that very simplistic task here where we instructed exactly the rule with this unambiguous cue uh, that you've seen, you know, gives rise to almost perfect behavior. So not, not much to do with. So it's like <laughs> basically, uh, you know, not, not, not very informative here about what subjects really are, you know, what's uh, happening in their minds because it's just too easy. What we do is that we have a more interesting task where now uh, the, the primary task is the same. So again, this orientation judgment, you know, uh, one of two hand movements, depending on the rule that's active. But now they're, the subjects are never explicitly instructed about the active rule, um, but they need to infer it. Um, and uh, the, the rule actually, which is hidden from the subjects, it also uh, it, you know, continues to switch uh, in an unpredictable and hidden fashion. And all that subjects get is this uh, a stream of noisy evidence samples here throughout the inter-trial interval. And those are basically the, the horizontal positions of these little dots here that are drawn from one of two distributions uh, with a mean that's you know, somewhat to the left or to the right of, from, from fixation. And that in turn is coupled to the active rule. Okay? And so, so they need to basically make this online inference, track the dots and figure out you know, which rule is currently active. And then when they get this you know, prompted by the actual task, apply that rule that they think is the more likely one uh, and uh, uh, basically respond to the grading. All right, so uh, to um, cut a long story short, what we do here is, you know, after fitting a bunch of different alternative models that can, you know, solve this, this online inference task, uh, it turns out that the sort of uh, normative, you know, uh, computation here, the normative model uh, for this type of uh, change point problem that has been developed by Chris Glaze and Josh Slab, it, it actually does the best, you know, job in fitting uh, the data of the participants. Uh, I guess many of you will have heard about it, but the, the, the basic idea is that, you know, with each sort of sample of evidence, uh, uh, you basically update your belief, you know, according to just base rule, you take your prior belief, uh, combine it with a new sample of evidence uh, into a posterior belief uh, using base rule. All of these are, you know, uh, log odds or, you know, uh, log uh, prior posterior ratios. Um, and uh, then you pass on that, you know, uh, posterior, uh, to the next updating step, uh, uh, where it then becomes uh, the, the, the updated prior belief. And importantly, to make this adaptive, you pass it through this nonlinearity here, the shape of which depends on the hazard rate, so on subjects, you know, internal model of the, you know, probability of a change uh, in the rule. That's the basic idea, and it does a very good job in uh, fitting the data if you allow there to be, you know, some uh, biases in the representation of the hazard rate and some uh, uh, some, you know, noise in the final uh, sort of, you know, busy like uh, decision transformation from the from the belief into the actual choice. In this case, choice is here a high level thing. So they're selecting, they're choosing a rule that they then apply uh, for uh, the limit. So I'm running through this in a bit more detail because it's also going to come back later. Um, now, uh, we one, once we fit this model to uh, every participant, um, uh, we have something that's very useful for what we want to do with the neural data. And I mean, we have a time course of, in this case here, the, you know, uh, log posterior uh, ratio. So, so uh, this thing that's plotted here in blue, which is basically the belief of the subject about which rule is more likely to be active at any given time. And um, you can see that's uh, basically the, I think it's the full data in this case, or it's like, you know, part of the data for one uh, example subject. You can see here, uh, it overall it tracks the truly active rule rather well. That's shown here in the colors. Um, but obviously, it also you know, fluctuates in a more graded and rapid fashion. And we think this, this fluctuation, a large part of this actually sort of reflects the sort of online inference process that's unfolding in the subject's mind. So what we can then do is uh, we can basically condition our analysis of the correlation structure in the cortex on uh, not the you know the, the the true rule that they don't have direct access to, but on this uh, sort of uh, you know internal belief state here uh, that we inferred from the model, and so uh, I'm showing this here uh, for basically the you know full noise correlation matrix here for like uh, segments of time where this is positive, so so basically the belief state favors rule number one, and uh, that looks like. Uh, a lot, but it's relatively uh, simple. So all of this stuff here 
is uh, basically um, orientation classifiers from uh, all the visual cortical areas that we have. Uh, all that stuff is um, uh, basically the uh, action classifiers from you know some subcortical and uh, cortical uh, motor regions. Let's see if I can get this out of the way. No, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so um, the important part of this matrix here is really in this rectangle. This is all the pairs of the stimulus and action classifiers and their uh, spontaneous correlations. Okay, and. You can see those those correlations here. They're 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 subtle. You know, much smaller than the say the correlations of the stimulus stimulus uh, decoders or action action decoder pairs. Um, but uh, they're not random. Um, and you know, you can see it. I, I guess by either you know most of them are somewhat reddish, uh, so tending more towards positive. Uh, this is when the belief state favors rule number one. Um, when the belief state then favors uh, rule. Um, uh, number two, uh, this becomes mostly bluish here. And uh, there's like for most of these cells here, a difference. And the simplest way to do statistics on this, you know, really tried a few different things and like it's it's all basically very consistent. We can just simply collapse across all these, these uh, cells here in this rectangle uh, and uh, compute the mean correlation for this one here and for this one there. And that's what's plotted here for every single subject. You can see there's, there's a very clear uh, difference uh, sort of in line with this sort of um, a switch uh, between uh, in the correlation, the sign of the correlation between the tools. Now, um, uh, with this task that subjects are doing here, uh, we can uh, do uh, something more. And I think that was even <laughs> suggested a while back, like uh, when we you know discussed it in a joint lab meeting with Josh, uh, like, uh, uh, and Rudy Fannenbrink presented this stuff in an earlier stage. You know, uh, we can here uh, like look at uh, more specifically the link to behavior because subjects are obviously they're often getting it wrong. Obviously, I mean, they're, you know, it's a hard task. So it's like, you know, different sources of uncertainty. And it turns out they make about like, you know, uh, a bit more than 20% uh, of errors here. And we call that, you know, we know from the simple task, the instructed rule task, that that's not due to this orientation judgment. They almost get this perfectly right. So it must be somehow about the inference process or the, you know, uh, kind of transformation into the the uh, five rule, and so the so the simple thing that we then do is sort the data before you know computing these noise correlations here, sort the data further uh, you know by segments that surround trials where they do get it right and those where they do get it wrong, uh, and when we do this uh, we get um, a very clear picture here around the correct trials. It's an even more consistent sort of flip uh, in uh, the sign of this noise correlation. And this is completely abolished around the times when they do get it wrong. And so this was quite encouraging for us to tell us that what we're looking at here is not some, you know, whatever weird stuff, but it seems to be tapping into the state of the network that is uh, actually somehow, you know, relevant uh, for uh, the behavior. Uh, even though, of course, that's still correlation at the moment, uh, but um, it, is, uh, it is a good uh, first, you know, um, piece of evidence that it's something meaningful. Now, uh, uh, a last slide here along uh, uh, this line of work, um, and that's a kind of busy slide, but I'm, you know, I'm just going to give you the gist here. So what what we did is, um, oops, ah, no, I'm randomly. <laughs> um, okay, so what we did is uh, uh, we assessed this um, this noise correlation structure in a time variant fashion. Uh, using a very simple trick, you know, here we have this sort of average across this entire segment of time. We can really assess the noise correlation or the sign of it, sort of si TR by TR, and have a time series of this uh, correlation here and there. And um, we then related this uh, to the time course uh, of uh, the activity of small uh, neuromodulatory structures uh, in the brainstem, in particular, uh, the locus ruralis here. And I'm not going to go into the details, but we've spent quite a bit of uh, time and work on uh, somehow getting this uh, right. Uh, that's all hidden, uh, but there's you know a bunch of older papers from 2017 by Jan Willem de Gee and uh, Olympia Colizzoli from uh, 2022, also comparing uh, 3T and uh, 7T measurements. So we, we, we're pretty sure that we can delineate uh, the locus ruralis in each individual using very simple uh, anatomical scans pretty precisely. And uh, we can, even though you know SNR is kind of crappy in these uh, uh, brainstem structures, but we can detect meaningful fMRI responses. So, for instance, here this is shown 
for the ventral tegmental area and the locus ruralis uh, for the response during the actual trials of this task. So, so um, you know, we, we think this is, uh, you know, useful stuff. It still doesn't have the spatial precision that we would like to have, but it's, you know, we're getting there. Uh, now, uh, in this task here, where they're, uh, you know, doing this in the scanner, we can then, of course, uh, lock uh, the responses of these structures to uh, something that's more interesting. And here, that's, you know, the time from this hidden rule switch. And what we see there is quite interesting. It's shown uh, kind of pooled for all these uh, structures together. It looks the same as for them individually, uh, locus ruralis, and the uh, basically dopaminergic uh, VTA and substantia nigra. All of them show increases in activity, some with some delay after the hidden rule switch. And um, uh, the basal forebrain, which is cholinergic or to, has many cholinergic neurons, uh, it also responds, but with an opposite sign, with a decrease, uh, which is something that we really didn't expect. And we're kind of trying to uh, figure out right now what, what exactly that means. Um, now, so, so there are basically responses to these hidden rule switches. And there's no magic here. One can explain this also in terms of uh, this you know, inference process. So there's some information that gets about it that gets you know processed in the brain and probably propagated to these structures and um uh, there's also responses in the pupil uh, to these hidden rule switches and those are correlated in particular with those in the locus ruralis and whenever uh, uh, they uh, these structures elevate their activity or the pupil dilates what we see is that the strength of this feature specific correlation pattern in the cortex gets uh, basically amplified uh, with and that's a kind of cross correlation analysis here with quite a substantial lag. So several seconds after dilation of the pupil, and likewise also brainstem response, we see uh, that whatever uh, was there, if it's you know, positive or negative, doesn't matter. We take the absolute value of this, this feature specific pattern gets, gets amplified. And um, this is something uh, that uh, uh, I'm currently very interested in. Uh, uh, I take this to be a possible index of some form of rapid plasticity that, you know, uh, basically imprints this new sort of sensory motor association into uh, the kind of the cortical circuitry. It's something that we would now want to uh, follow up on using a sort of pharmacological intervention. So for instance, blocking some uh, uh, types of noradrenaline receptors and see if we find that still. All right, so uh, to wrap up this part, um, uh, what we see here is that task-specific cortical pathways seem to reconfigure uh, in a, a rule-dependent fashion. Uh, in the context of this task. I think it's context dependent in general. And um, uh, this is, uh, at least to some extent, seems to be governed by brainstem uh, arousal systems. And um, now I'm going to move on to the second sort of line of work uh, that's been using MEG over the years. I have to just, I have no sense of time at the moment. So where, oh, yeah, very good, thanks. Um, great. So, so, um, Another sort of related um, uh, question that um, uh, has occupied me for a while is um, uh, basically how uh, dynamics, neural dynamics, uh, different stages in the cortical hierarchy contribute to this form of dynamic belief updating that we have, for instance, probed in this previous task and that we think is very generally you know, relevant for, for cognitive behavior. And with hierarchy here, I'm just you know illustrating this in terms of uh, this famous uh, Feynman and Van Essen scheme of the you know visual cortical hierarchy. Uh, without you know saying that that's ex exact you know thing that's true, it's just like that that is just you know uh, very the, the, probably the most famous depiction of this. Um, and so so it seems well we've learned that you know from a lot of behavioral work that uh, humans uh, definitely monkeys as well can integrate uh, sort of, you know, incoming sensory evidence into belief states, so in a very adaptive fashion. Um, and it seems reasonable to assume that, you know, the incoming sensory evidence is first encoded, you know, in early sensory cortices here, say, you know, primary visual cortex for the simple, you know, retinotopic stimulus uh, that we've used there. Uh, whereas, the, you know, the belief states uh, that really then govern the behavior are encoded in the higher tie areas of the hierarchy. And uh, for me, an important question is to figure out, you know, what uh, the meaning is of these massive feedback connections that we know exist in the hierarchy that go, you know, from these higher tire stages down to the lower tire stages. Uh, they're, you know, anatomically, they're there, they're massive. But what exactly they do in the context of this dynamic belief updating uh, is uh, not so uh, clear uh, yet. And that was uh, the 
Uh, the question we wanted to get at in a bunch of MEG studies done uh, by these two uh, great postdocs here, Peter Murphy and Niklas Wilming, both of them have left the lab by now. Um, uh, we used in both their studies, which were you know, very much coordinated, uh, kind of different forms of this uh, sort of you know, online inference tasks, as you wish, you know, that, that uh, like the one we've had before in the rule learning, uh, only that we had different sort of, you know, basically sensory evidence in different kind of, you know, um, uh, different formats. Uh, and subjects here, uh, they didn't use their inference about which two states is currently active and generating the evidence. They didn't use it for this kind of, you know, higher tire decision selecting a rule, but rather they directly reported it at the end uh, of uh, the trial where they saw something like, you know, 10 evidence samples. So, so they pushed a button with the left hand for, you know, uh, uh, state one is active or with the, with the right hand for state two is active. Now, um, the the format of the evidence here is different for reasons I won't go into here. Uh, here we used, you know, uh, gratings uh, of uh, um, different contrasts. You know, here we wanted to specifically look at, you know, clear gamma band activity, which is, you know, that's the kind of stimulus uh, for that. Um, and uh, they, 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 those were drawn from a distribution whose mean was either uh, larger or smaller uh, than the 50% contrast of a reference stimulus that was shown at the start of the trial. And in this case here, it was just like in this uh, rule switching task before, it was just a position uh, of like this tiny dot um, uh, here, uh, of the polar angle along the, you know, this lower half circle. And it was drawn from one of those two distributions that you can see here. In this case here, not in this one, there were also these um, uh, hidden uh, switches um, in the rule with a certain uh, low hazard rate. Now, um, the first thing that uh, we do then is uh, basically um, model the behavior of the participants uh, to again get at these you know, latent variables that we're interested in, like belief states, uh, you know, uh, prior, posterior, and other stuff as well that I'm uh, gonna uh, expand on in a bit later. Again, here it's the, you know, I don't want to go through all of this. It takes too much time, but the, the, the simple upshot is it's this, you know, once you allow uh, there is some subjectivity in the estimation of the hazard rate and some noise in the process and the, the, uh, this, uh, you know, normative model here uh, that's been developed here by, by Joss Lab that it, it by far does the best job uh, in fitting behavior overall, but really for the vast majority of participants individually also. Right, so, so uh, that means to us then uh, that we can take the latent variables of these models seriously and use them for our analyses. And what we wanted to do here is uh, not a, like a decoding analysis, but an encoding analysis, fitting a big regression model to the neural data to see how these different variables, which sometimes seem to be a bit correlated, uh, you know, how they basically uh, um, uh, shape uh, the neural dynamics at different stages. So what Peter figured out is uh, that this, basically this, this um, normative process here, which basically, you know, sorry, um, uh, transforms the posterior, uh, you know, pushes it through this nonlinear transform to turn it into a prior. Uh, this can be approximated almost perfectly with a very simple linear decomposition, at least for this, you know, regime of noise and, and hazard rates that we were working with. And that's shown here. Uh, so we take the prior, the evidence, and in order to, uh, you know, approximate this transformation uh, from the posterior to uh, the updated prior, uh, we uh, basically just, you know, add these two terms here, one, both of which sort of, uh, you know, multiply the incoming sample of evidence uh, with, uh, you know, meaningful computational variables. And one is this, what we call CPP, change point probability, uh, basically the, you know, likelihood that, that uh, um, a change has happened right now, given your belief state before and the new sample of evidence and your model of the hazard rate. And then uh, this is something like the, you know, basically the overall strength uh, of your prior belief at that moment. And the intuition here is quite simple that, you know, whenever uh, uh, you see a new sample of evidence in moments where you're very uncertain about uh, which state it is right now, or uh, where there's, you know, high probability of a change, you're basically just cranking up the gain of the evidence. So you allow it, you know, to, uh, give it stronger weight in the updating uh, of uh, the uh, belief state, yeah? Uh, now, now uh, why do we do this? Well, because with this, you know, simple linear approximation, we basically have something that we can uh, directly put into a linear regression model that we can fit on the neural data. 
which is uh, something uh, that we did here. So these are basically the four main regressors, prior evidence uh, and the, you know, uh, basically these two interaction terms here, evidence multiplied with uh, CPP or answer. Um, there are some nuisance regressors as well, but uh, they, they don't matter here. For me. Now we fit this uh, on the uh, power of the MEG signal, specifically the lateralization of power, uh, you know, left versus right hemisphere, which seemed natural in this task because, you know, the visual, you know, evidence is in a, this kind of lateralized format. So it's really just the polar angle that, that matters. Likewise, you know, they're, they're making responses to the left, left or the right hand. And now I'm showing uh, time frequency maps of the encoding uh, of uh, here, just one term, the evidence in uh, the MEG power lateralization across a bunch of different areas across the cortical hierarchy. Uh, so uh, this is shown here. This is, you know, V1 is all the way on the left. Uh, uh, all of these are higher tie extra strides, uh, you know, um, uh, visual field maps. And uh, uh, these ones here are parietal and then premotor and finally primary motor regions that are, you know, we know action selective. So it's kind of, you could think of it like, you know, a stream from sensory cortex over association cortex into the more motor cortex. And uh, what we're showing here are time frequency maps of not the power lateralization itself, but really of the encoding. So the, the beta coefficients for uh, the evidence here uh, in the power lateralization. And it's always locked to the onset of a single sample in the stream. Right, so, um, uh, you know, there's a lot going on here, but one thing that you can see very clearly is that there's encoding of uh, the evidence uh, in uh, this, you know, gamma, it's like, you know, uh, maybe high gamma, even though it's, it doesn't look as broad, but, but I mean, that's a discussion I don't want to go into here. It's, a, it's definitely in this, you know, higher frequency range, uh, something that looks very much like a sensory response. So it's like, it comes up, you know, with short latency after the sample is shown, and uh, then this information remains present for some, you know, about 400 milliseconds, uh, about the time when the next sample comes up. Now, uh, when we look at the encoding of uh, the prior belief here, uh, we see very different dynamics. So here we see uh, uh, encoding um, uh, of the prior and the alpha lateralization with an opposite sign. And in this very sustained form, so it's obviously already there, you know, before the sample comes up because we had the prior belief already then. And it is sustained throughout the entire you know, presentation, even of the, you know, the next and the second next sample. Uh, and importantly, also different from this encoding here in gamma, this is something that we find basically all across cortex. So wherever we look, in, at least not wherever, but in these regions here, there's lateralization uh, that encodes the, 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 basically the, the sign and the strength of the prior belief. Whereas the representation or the encoding of the, uh, um, uh, the evidence is really in the gamma band uh, is uh, quite confined to these uh, visual cortical field maps. So, so this was something that uh, we already found interesting. It's, you know, we uh, thought it's somewhat in line uh, with ideas that have been uh, put forward by, you know, a bunch of people, Pascal Fries, also Peter Rupsema, who I learned was just here recently, you know, like about 10 years ago, there were a bunch of papers that suggested that there is basically, um, you know, uh, uh, second propagation across the visual cortical hierarchy uh, in uh, different directions using these distinct frequency channels. So, so that, you know, uh, uh, sort of information would be propagated upwards uh, from early visual cortex up the hierarchy in a sort of gamma frequency channel, uh, whereas uh, signal would flow backwards down the hierarchy in the alpha frequency channel. Those were all studies, uh, they were very carefully done, but uh, they basically took completely content, you know, non-specific signals. So they just look at signal fluctuations at different stages in the hierarchy or stimulated at one stage and measured in the other stage. Um, and uh, it was completely unclear what these signals would actually you know, encode. Uh, and uh, we think that's where our sort of uh, regression analysis using uh, these you know, well-controlled belief updating tasks come in because now we have really a precise handle on things like a, you know, a belief state or prior uh, versus uh, the evidence and these these findings here, they're you know they're at least in line uh, with this uh, basic idea. Now, um, uh, something um, that we uh, we haven't done yet that we're currently doing uh, in collaboration with uh, Stefano Panzeri, is a new faculty at Hamburg who develops a lot of information theoretic tools for neural data analysis. So, so we're now looking at basically um, uh, 
feature specific or you know uh, content specific information transfer from one region to the other, uh, which could be useful to you know basically nail this uh, for the, this this idea uh, that I'm putting up here in this cartoon. One thing uh, that uh, we've done already then is uh, look at a uh, at a proxy. Uh, of uh, feedback of decision variables or belief states uh, to sensory cortex, which is uh, choice uh, probability. Um, uh, and that's something um, uh, that I'm not sure, how, you know, about the audience here, I'm, you know, how familiar people are with that, but that's uh, uh, been a measure of, you know, essentially the correlation between spontaneous fluctuations in neural responses in sensory cortex and the behavioral choice of the monkey after having accounted for the trial by trial fluctuations in the stimulus. And um, there was a very inspiring paper by Henrik Nienborg and Bruce Cumming, uh, you know, nature uh, some well, already, you know, 15 years back uh, that indicated with a very careful analysis that this can be in this choice probability that you measure in early sensory cortex uh, is, uh, is very sensitive. It's not only that, but it's very sensitive to feedback of, you know, decision states from higher tire regions into the sensory cortex. And this was also supported by, you know, hierarchical sort of uh, circuit modeling uh, for, for busy evidence accumulation, decision-making tasks, different kinds of models here. So, so we take basically that, that measure and we want to see, you know, whether uh, uh, this is basically consistent, this, you know, choice probability is consistent uh, with the idea that we have here this feedback of, you know, evolving belief states into uh, early sensory cortex. Okay. Um, and of course, the question here then is like, how do we isolate these spontaneous signal fluctuations in the MEG. Uh, that's a more complex task that we have here. There's a lot of you know, stuff going on throughout the trial. Now, um, recall we have this encoding model uh, that well seems to also capture, it fits the data, the MEG data in this case uh, rather well. We've seen that you know, we have in there the, you know, these bunch of regressors. Uh, we fit this to the MEG power lateralization data. And then we get for every single uh, regressor here, we get these time frequency maps of the encoding. Um, and I'm showing this just like that's the same that I've shown before. Now, in this model, of course, we have then also time frequency maps of once we fit it of the residuals. Okay, and uh, this is basically all the stuff that the you know like moment to moment fluctuations in the MEG signal that is not captured by uh, this model that we fit to the data, and that's our measure of intrinsic fluctuation. And then we take that these these maps and relate them to the final behavioral choice of the subjects. Okay, just a simple logistic regression. Um, and uh, this is the result. Um, we have this again, you know, time frequency maps now of the sort of leverage on choice, as you will. Again, it's, you know, uh, uh, simple uh, like uh, um, uh, T-scores here, uh, beta coefficients. Um, again, across, you know, this say sensory motor pathway. Uh, this is, you know, basically for sample or moments of time that come late in the trial. This is uh, early in the trial. The only interesting stuff happens here late in the trial. Uh, what we have is in, you know, in these action selective regions here, parietal, premotor, motor cortex, exactly what we expected. There's leverage on the choice in a sort of beta frequency band and in this alpha frequency band. Yeah, and this is exactly what we would expect. You know, these regions, the activity in these regions very closely tied to the action that subjects choose. So, so you would expect that fluctuations in this signal over and above what's explained by the model has some leverage on the, on the behavioral choice. Now, the interesting thing then is uh, what happens here in the back of the brain. So we see this very clear leverage also in the alpha lateralization uh, and specifically in V1, a little bit in V2, uh, but uh, really in all these higher tire areas, it's completely gone. Yeah. Um, and so, so uh, this is, uh, well, for us, it was uh, pretty cool to see that. It's very clear sort of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, evidence for the, the idea that we have here some, you know, behaviorally relevant signal uh, that might be propagated down uh, into the early sensory cortex. And I'm going to skip through this in the interest of time. Just the, the basic point is we see the same effect, this kind of choice probability specifically in alpha in uh, this uh, contrast uh, averaging task just as well. And kind of here, we also related it to the dynamics of the buildup of choice predictive activity in the motor cortex. So it kind of gradually builds up over time, this leverage in V1. Uh, and uh, this appears with some lag 
following the buildup of choice predictive activity in the motor cortex that is at least consistent with uh, some feedback effect. Now, um, if we take this, you know, at face value and saying, well, maybe that's an index of, of uh, you know, feedback of, let's say, decision states into sensory cortex. Question is, why is it there? And, you know, um, is it just basically stereotypical? Is it just because there's anatomical feedback connections and then whatever happens, uh, you know, in these, these higher tire areas gets propagated down uh, uh, into the sensory cortex? Um, or is it uh, something uh, that is basically essentially recruited in a, in a context-dependent fashion when it might make sense. And we thought uh, the, um, the interesting context variable here would be the volatility you know, of the environment, right? So uh, in um, these experiments, all the ones I've been talking about so far, uh, the environment, there was some possibility or some probability of a change, but it was always very, very low. Um, and in that case, it, you know, it might make sense for the brain under certain assumptions uh, to, you know, when strong belief states have already been kind of built up in higher tier areas to, uh, you know, feed these back into the early sensory cortex and somehow have it shape, you know, the state of sensory cortex. Uh, but then this stuff should disappear when you're operating in this, you know, high volatility context where things are very likely to change or the state. So, so we did basically this experiment here where we now had uh, subjects come in and do the same task, but in different sessions using different uh, volatilities. They knew about this, they were trained to that, and we you know, thought, or we see in the data, they incorporate this into their you know, subjective hazard rate. Here's what we're looking for. That's exactly the result just from uh, that I've shown before, just to you know, uh, uh, recapitulate that. Um, here, uh, this contralateral leverage in V1. Here we have a bit, you know, fewer data, so we're just, you know, collapsing here um, in this new experiment across uh, this full time frequency sort of uh, uh, block, basically that you see here uh, in red. And then we're going to plot this as a function of the volatility, and that's what we're seeing. So we see uh, negative contralateral leverage, basically replicating um, uh, this same effect that we've seen here in this early experiment uh, for this low hazard rate when here the hazard rate is uh, 0 0.01. Um, and in the high hazard rate condition, uh, this uh, not only does that disappear, but it even flips sign. Uh, and that's something that we see nowhere else uh, uh, in the brain, only in V1. Um, uh, and so there's a very clear context dependence here of uh, this you know, proxy of uh, belief feedback. Right. Um, now, that's uh, I think that's the last I hope it's the last data slide here. <laughs> um, and uh, that's uh, basically ongoing work that we're doing to try and relate these, uh, uh, you know, what we consider feedback, you know, proxies of feedback processing in the hierarchy uh, to um, uh, essentially these, these uh, you know, arousal, manipulations of uh, arousal states and neuromodulatory systems. We don't, in the MEG, we cannot track the activity of brainstem, nuclei. I wish we could, but we can't. So, so all we have is here the diameter of the pupil. And what you're seeing in this task here is the uh, dilation of the pupil overall during you know, this, this uh, very protracted uh, uh, decision-making task. Uh, there's exactly what one would expect, you know, old results from you know, 1960s down in Kahneman and such, you know, whenever you engage in a challenging task, the pupil will dilate in this protracted fashion for as long as you're working on the task, and then it kind of goes back to baseline. And that's what you see here. But what you also see are these little uh, wiggles, or maybe you see them. You can see them much better if you take the first temporal derivative here in green of this, this uh, time course. Uh, there's basically like a kind of micro dilation of the pupil uh, with every single onset of a sample. Okay? And um, uh, for a number of reasons, we are pretty sure that this is uh, not due to, to these you know, stimuli being shown. Um, in fact, they're, you know, uh, on average, they're isoluminum with the background, they're tiny, but it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the important point is P Peter also then fits to really get at the cognitive content of these microdilations. He fits again a regression model now to this pupil response uh, on each sample. And um, he uh, has now a bunch of different regressors. The important ones are just the change point probability as such and the uncertainty. So we don't think that the you know these sign variables evidence or belief they are not encoded in the in the brainstem, but these uncertainty or surprise variables they might be. And in fact, like uh, work from George Gold showed there there are also in other kinds of uh, contexts. 
And what we see is indeed, I'm not showing this here, but it's in the paper. So, so it's the same nature neuroscience paper that I was referring to that's again hidden from view. <laughs> Um, uh, it's there's clear and very robust encoding of the change point probability and of the uncertainty. So whenever you know the change point probability is large, the pupil response to a sample will be uh, enlarged. And now uh, we're then asking, okay, so is that somehow does that modulate the way uh, the evidence is being encoded here uh, in uh, uh, in the cortex? The simple idea being that. Um, you know, when basically like like we had it described in this model, when when the you know um, when this large change point probability basically cranks up the gain on the sensory evidence. So what we expected in a very simplistic fashion, we would see enlarged basic encoding of uh, the sensory evidence here, for instance, uh, in the gamma frequency band in these uh, you know transient responses. And that's not at all what we've seen. Um, instead, what we saw is a modulation of the encoding of the evidence in this uh, alpha frequency band here, uh, again, starting from uh, V1. Just to be clear what we're looking at here, this is uh, the beta coefficients of an interaction term. So uh, the encoding of the LLR times the pupil response uh, the, you know, uh, to, this, to this sample. So what, what this basically tells us is that whenever the pupil response happens to be large, then there is a stronger encoding of the evidence sample in uh, the alpha lateralization, and um, that's something that you know it's not it's not consistent with this uh, idea at least that I promoted before that you know we're looking at a proxy of, of the belief state here in the uh, uh, sensory cortex, um, um, or well it might be what we think what this might reflect is that it's somehow the arousal response somehow it, it changes not the encoding of the evidence as such in cortex but rather. The, the, the updating of uh, the uh, belief state um, um, uh, based on the new uh, evidence sample. And that's something, yeah, we would like to get at now um, with, again, with pharmacological interventions. Okay, so uh, that's a wrap up of this part. Uh, we see that there's a reflection of evolving belief states and the upcoming decision in V1 alpha band activity during decision formation. And that clearly depends on the environmental volatility. And uh, that process that we see in V1 uh, uh, and the alpha band activity specifically seems to be modulated in a temporally and spatially selective manner by phasic arousal responses. And uh, I'm just, yeah, it's very late. So I'm going to skip through this. That's new clinical work that we're doing where we're linking this stuff that we're seeing, at least in behavior and the uh, arousal responses to psychosis risk, where we see some quite interesting effects already. So, so let me wrap up here. I've shown that decision computations in the human cortex are dynamically sculpted uh, by external context and by internal brain states. And we think that this dynamic sculpting endows cognitive behaviors uh, with the flexibility that really sets them apart from reflex behaviors. Uh, and that's just, again, speculation. So I think that these insights have clinical implications that I really want to push for now. Uh, and they also might cast some doubts on these kind of, you know, Sherringtonian approaches of uh, understanding the implementation of cognitive computation through sort of, you know, neuron to neuron, mapping out neuron to neuron connections um, at a very, very kind of detailed level. Uh, because what seems to be the case is really that these uh, pathways are extremely malleable and change all the time. Um, and this is my lab uh, and my main collaborators at the moment. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> One question I have about the um, this notion that you have uh, gamma activity um, moving up the hierarchy and then this return of alpha beliefs coming back down. Can you distinguish that from just having a reciprocal relationship between uh, gamma yeah. and alpha? Yeah, right. So, so for I mean, like. Yeah, and, and uh, that's exactly the things that we were worried about. Do you just see always the flip side? You know, it's always one thing, and then, you know, you have gamma and up. So here, for, then you would always see in every single analysis, you would see basically the, you know, like positive effect in gamma, the negative effect in alpha, and that's not what we see here. It's also not, especially in this choice probability analysis, not at all, both of these tasks. So we think that this is really distinct. When we really 
that do something that isolates this you know feedback of a belief state uh, that that is uh, uh, we we only see that uh, in in alpha and uh, that's you know one of the things we're working on now where we really look at not just the local activity but really at the interactions so basically quantify the information uh, flow in a frequency specific fashion from you know high tire areas to a v1 uh, that is so far it really seems to uh, even separate out these two bands in an even more clear case uh, a clear manner yeah. great thank you yeah Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, um, I mean, it's a it's a very broad question. So there are many different, you know, there's not so many many different disorders, and one should distinguish. What I what I do know from our uh, first study on this is that uh, when we when we just assess the community sample, so not you know, not patients diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia but just from you know questionnaire clinical questionnaires we kind of kind of evaluate their risk of developing psychosis those uh, who are at a high risk of developing psychosis uh, uh, what is very clear is that um, their their encoding uh, of this change point probability and uncertainty in the in the pupil response uh, that thing is uh, uh, clearly diminished so so uh, there's like it seems the pupil still responds, you know, like this stuff here, gray thing is just there. It's not changed, but like the, this, this, you know, cognitive information uh, uh, is uh, um, not encoded so, so well in the pupil. Um, and the other thing that we see, if, if you look at the sort of using psychophysical kernel analysis, uh, the way they update sort of sample or weigh sample by sample, uh, you know, uh, the, um, the, the, the evidence uh, in their final choice, uh, that seems to be affected in a way that like this kind of, you know, what's been known or described before, I'm not sure if it had been known, but like people speculated about it, that, that there is this jumping to conclusions. So, so there is a tendency, like overall we get recency here, more weighting of late evidence, but it's clearly more towards primacy in these people with a high risk of uh, psychosis. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> So uh, probably not surprisingly, I'm, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to what a statement you made about um, sort of the, the time course of the, of the uh, dopamine and, and uh, noradrenergic yeah. signals maybe being a, a signal of sort of plastic, rapid plasticity yeah. sort of during these things. Just curious, um, get your thoughts on an obvious challenge given the kinds of things that you measure that we have access to is the time course and how slow it is compared yeah. to what's going on. Like, have you thought about, um, I mean, one specific version of that, like, do you have data or do you have plans for experiments, how you could get yeah. to even convince yourself what's cause and what's effect? Like, yeah. Right? Yeah. Sure. So, so uh, um, what I really want to do is uh, use a new stimulation. Is, you know, yeah, but you, you will know about it, you know, this uh, transcranial ultrasound simulation, which is also being used in, in uh, monkeys now. So people at Oxford now, they have... Uh, uh, shown like in monkeys that uh, like you can't quite what you can target you know it's it is supposed to be spatially very precise and you can target uh, for instance the locus rules with it so so uh, and you know you can basically like you know do this sort of online in the ideal case we would do this during say eg recordings or so and then like you know do like on and off between like locus rules stimulation and see if this basically this correlation that i've uh, shown there if that uh, disappears when we kind of shut down the locus rules I mean, there, you know, that's going to be an experiment, like probably not before five years from now, because there's a lot of, you know, ethical kind of, you know, boundaries. So we first have to make sure it's safe. But that's the kind of thing where I'd really like to go to. The, the first thing that we're going to try already is uh, doing this in the MEG and then uh, giving different uh, noradrenaline receptor uh, blockers, basically, and see, you know, um, that should, you know, that's then not going to be illuminating on the time course, but we're, you know, it will kind of for a given session should like abolish or reduce that that correlation that we see. Yeah. Thanks.